Uh, there's one of my sessions that was at Rice University in Houston, Texas last year. I was on a panel with uh, Fahad Taslim. He's a Muslim leader down there. So he and I went back and forth in front of about 75 Muslims and Christians one night. And we had a wonderful time. So uh, that's my exciting life right there, uh, hanging out with people who believe a little bit differently than I do. And I seem to thrive in that situation. I'm gonna tell you about a young woman I met. I think I met her in 2016 or 17, I forget. Her name is Deidre uh, Reyes. Uh, she's a, a Native American member of the Hopi tribe of uh, Arizona. And uh, let's see here. Uh, how can I do this? Oh, I'll just tell her story. Uh, well, here's, here's the story that she told me. I was writing a book called Faith Unexpected and I met her in Phoenix and she told me her story. So it started off by her talking about her time uh, when she was young on the Hopi reservation in Northern Arizona. And her mother was a Christian of sorts and her father unfortunately was an alcoholic and not practicing any faith, maybe dabbling in uh, Hopi spirituality. Well, she got in trouble early in her life, that being Deidre. Uh, she and a friend wanted to go to a dance across the reservation uh, when they were 13 years old. And her father had promised to take them in the car while well, he was passed out drunk on the couch. So the girls decided we're going to this dance anyway. They took matters into their own hands. They grabbed the car keys to the Chevy Lumina and these 13 year olds hopped in the car and drove across the reservation to go to this dance. And on the way there, they stopped at a liquor store and they bought a bottle of Captain Morgan spiced rum. And these 13 year old girls for the very first times in their lives got drunk. And it led to a whole series of problems. They got in big trouble that night. And so that was one of a number of incidents in Deidre's life that happened in cars or other vehicles. Uh, one time, uh, Deidre had, she was seeing a guy, he was an abusive boyfriend when she was in high school and they were in a moving vehicle and he pushed her out of the car when the car was moving and it broke her nose. Another time when she was driving, uh, she was driving uh, 85 miles an hour in a 35 zone in Phoenix because uh, she and a friend wanted to get to a liquor store late at night and she got nailed by the cops for that going 85 into 35 and she got a DUI and a week in jail. And then the big one came. She was 21 years old. Her brother had given her a gift of a handgun. She'd been practicing it the day before and she had stowed it in her glove compartment of her car. And so she was driving in South Phoenix and got into a road rage incident with a guy and she pulled a gun on him. She ended up not firing it. And she, the way she told it, she goes, yeah, I should just fire this thing. I should just kill this guy and then kill myself. What's the big deal? I don't have much of a life anyway. Then she thought better of it. She pulled a U-turn and she took off. Well, the guy got her license plate number. Turns out he was an ex-cop and Deidre served nine months in jail. Now you'd think someone who served that much time in jail when they got out, they would have learned a lesson. First thing that she did, feeling all lonely and empty when she got out of jail, went right back into the party scene in Phoenix. She had money because she was collecting uh, income from the casino since she was Hopi. Uh, so she had cash, she's, she's going all to, all to the rave parties and everything, and she dove right back into the drug and alcohol scene of Phoenix with a lot of other young people. So she's in a lot of trouble. Well, then she took a job as a blackjack dealer. And uh, one night when she was 22 years old, she got a tap on the shoulder to come and take a phone call. And she just knew it had something to do with her father. And she got there and uh, her aunt said, your father has had a heart attack. And Deidre says, oh, I got to go. What hospital is he at? Well, he's not at a hospital. He's at the morgue. And so Deidre panicked. She went into mourning and grief. And then a very strange thing started happening to Deidre. And that is she was visited by spirits. Uh, animals would come to her uh, 
her house and in front of her vehicle. And it was a very scary time for her. And it was all mixed up with a Hopi spirituality. So she and her mother went to the medicine man and the medicine man did an exorcism and uh, it was all very weird, but she continued on with her alcohol and drugs. And then about a year later, uh, she was home alone on a Saturday night and she got drunk by herself. She was smoking weed and got drunk by herself. She woke up the next morning just feeling horrible. She went for a hike on South Mountain. I've been on South Mountain hiking there. It's a beautiful place. And she sat up there and she just had a moment of reflection. And she said to herself, man, I have made a mess of my life. I should be, my life. I should have it together by now, is what she said. And so she said, well, how do these Christians that I've known, how do they do it? Maybe I should go to church. This was on a Sunday morning. So she Googled area churches and she came up with a church called Passages Christian Fellowship. Found out what the service time was and she drove over there. And she said, well, I'll just sneak in and sneak out. Then no one will know that I was even there. She went to the service and as she tells it, I don't even know what they talked about. All I know is that afterward, I went back out to my car and I was crying. She had been so deeply touched by the message. And, and yet she still had some questions. The following week, she went back to Passages Church and uh, Pastor Keith Bethel there, he made a call to faith. He invited people to come forward who wanted to start a relationship with Jesus. And so Deidre went forward and accepted Jesus into her life, became a follower of Jesus. And her life dramatically changed after that. She got into a Bible study, but she was in for a year. And then she went away to Bible school at Indian Bible College in Flagstaff, Arizona. And after she graduated uh, her two-year degree there, she came on staff at IBC. And uh, so I just emailed with her the other day. And I said, how are you doing? She said, oh, I love IBC. I'm helping young native uh, Christians here grow in their faith. And uh, she's just a joy to be around. I'm so proud of her to see her life change so dramatically by coming to faith in Jesus, Deidre Reyes. So I wrote up her story in a book and I'll tell you the name of that book here in a few minutes. But uh, uh, Laura Lee, why don't we have a discussion now and uh, I don't know if we need to go into breakout rooms or just stay here, whatever you prefer. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, what did you learn from Deidre's story? And if you could meet Deidre, if you could go to IBC and talk to Deidre, what would you want to ask her? Maybe those are the two questions we could talk about right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, try to draw you folks into the conversation so I'm not doing all the talking. Yeah. So what did you learn from Deidre's story? And if you could meet Deidre, what would you want to ask her? So I'll stop sharing here and yeah. and uh, Laura, Laura, I think I'll turn it over to you for this discussion. Yeah, we can probably um, stay here um, just because there's not that many of us, so we can we can kind of discuss here. Um, yeah, just different kind of what what Rick was saying. You know, what what are some things that kind of stood out about that story and anything that you would ask her if you could. If you could talk to her. Yeah, I wish you could all meet her. She is, she's a cool cat. I really <laughs> like her. Uh, How old is she, you said? Uh, right now, Deidre must be around 25, I would guess, maybe 26. Wow, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, any, any thoughts about that um, before we kind of move on? I mean, I would say that she, you know, hit rock bottom a lot and went through a lot of heavy um, journey parts, which we all go through at different times. Um, but she was allowing herself to be vulnerable and open to, um, you know, faith and a hope that was bigger than herself, which takes time for all of us to get through. And sometimes it does hit, takes a lot of hitting rock bottom to get there. And going through heavy parts so that shows the power of you know faith and perseverance mm -hmm. even in the smallest moments when people are struggling for sure for sure yeah there's kind of a motivation from her to kind of right. you know look look beyond her circumstances you know what is what is going on yeah um outside of herself and not just 
kind of staying where she was. So yeah. Any other thoughts um, on her story? I know Aaron, you just kind of joined, so um, <laughs> you you could just make up your thoughts. But yeah, um, anybody else have any thoughts about her story? Uh, well, I guess one thing I kind of learned, I've heard it before, but I haven't heard one so personal before that people in darker places than me can find hope and faith that way through God. Yeah, yeah, it's really encouraging for sure. Yeah, I would say I really like hearing stories like that, not because they're like super fun in ways to, to hear that story of, of darkness and um, you know that she went through hard things but it also just kind of you know amazes me in a way because I've always grown up in the faith I've always known about God I've always known about the Bible and everything like that and how it would be to hear about it for the first time as like a teenager or as an adult or something that just sounds I don't know like I don't I want to like rewrite my life or whatever for that, but just thinking about the fact that, you know, just hearing for the first time and hearing all the hope and all of the, you know, the love that comes with it. I don't know. That would just be amazing. And I think that's sometimes that's why some people that are, that find it later in life are seem a little bit more passionate about it than people that, you know, kind of taken it for granted over the years. So, you know, that's that's really cool that that God can work through people who've known it their entire lives or people that you know go through stuff and then they find it at the end so yeah that's I, I appreciate you sharing that that'd be cool I hope um we can we can all meet her someday I'm trying to think of a question that I can that could be I'll just tell you that uh, the medicine man her his diagnosis mm -hmm of her when, when uh, Deidre and her mom went to visit the medicine man, he said, well, your dad is calling to you from the other side. He wants you here. And that's mm -hmm. why she was being uh, haunted by spirits. They were calling her over into death. Yeah. So, uh, he wanted a guide, he believed in her. And so they had to do this uh, exorcism where the portal, the, co the communication was uh, shut off. It was, it was all very weird. And it's, it's I'm, I'm summarizing it. There's a lot of details in the story that are a little frightening, but in the end, she was delivered, uh, not by the medicine man, but by Jesus. Right. Yeah, spirits are definitely not something to mess with. No. You know, it's, I've heard many, many a story, many a tale of, of people messing with them, and it's serious stuff, for sure. Yeah, any other thoughts that um, about the story before we kind of move on to the next thing? All right, all right, Rick, giving it over to you. I wanna talk about the gospel tonight. This is gonna be so basic. It's gonna be review probably for most of us, but Folks, I think there's something at stake right now in the gospel. People like to change the gospel. <laughs> I guess in modern day times, we think we're pretty smart. And my thought here is, well, what is the gospel according to Jesus? Uh, he's the authority on the gospel. So just a few verses here in summary. This is the, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only is one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And notice what the motive is here. We often think of God as being judgmental, and I think he is, but the God's character is uh, his love. He gets angry because he does love. <laughs> but the first thing to be said, uh, the first character trait of God is that he loves. He loves the world. He loves each one of us. That's why Jesus came to sacrifice himself for us. It was out of the motive of love. And uh, the call here is for us to believe in him so that we would not perish, but uh, have everlasting life. And then a few verses later in John 3, the father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands 
So notice that the son really has the authority here. So when we talk about the gospel according to Jesus, it's the gospel according to someone who has authority. Verse 36, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. I've had a good number of friends over the years, acquaintances, reject the son. My friend Michael, who's from the northwest coast, uh, came to school in the Midwest where I met him. And he was uh, an university student leader. And then after about seven or eight years of marriage, uh, he gave up on Jesus and he went the other way. And so uh, what the Gospel of John says, is that whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. I think this idea of wrath is hard for us to swallow. Uh, as Americans, we tend to be very positive and we think God is very positive. And yet there are some stark truths about God that we need to recognize. And we're not really free. <laughs> you know, we're not free to remake God into our image. Uh, God, is, God is who he is. And this is how he's revealed himself to us. So I said to Michael, I said, well, if you reject the son, then God's wrath is on you. And he goes, well, I don't believe in that stuff anymore. Okay, Michael. Well, <laughs> uh, someday there could be a, a very serious reckoning here uh, for your life. And I didn't mean to be mean-spirited about that. I don't delight in that. I don't mean to be a judgmental person. And yet the truth remains. This is the gospel according to Jesus. Switching over to Paul, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. A number of my friends and acquaintances who have left the faith, they always go back to being a good person. They always go back to works. They always think that if there is a God, they'll be saved by their good works. And uh, apparently Jesus and Paul disagree with that. So uh, yeah, there's a guy in Cincinnati. His name is, name is uh, Bart Campolo. I met with Bart a couple years ago because I hang out in Cincinnati sometimes. And uh, Bart used to be a Christian. He isn't anymore. If there is a God, which he thinks there isn't, then it's going to depend on his good works, him being a kind person. Well, uh, according to Ephesians here, you can't earn your salvation. It's by grace. Salvation is a gift from God. You can, it's not through your own merit or through your own works. Uh, it's a gift that's given to us, and it's given by faith. And it says here, not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So I tried to communicate to Bart that, well, it's not by works. You can't earn your salvation. And Bart said, oh, there's probably not a God anyway. Oh, I don't know. If Jesus is the Son of God, then there is a God. If Jesus did his miracles, then there is a God. If Jesus rose from the dead and is sitting at the right hand of the Father, then there is a God. So anyway, those of us who are Christians, I think it's good to maintain a humble posture about these things, not fall into judgmentalism, take no delight in the judgments of God, and yet here they are. And never get fooled into thinking that the gospel, uh, salvation can be earned it's not through our merits. It's a gift of God that we receive by faith. I'm just summarizing here tonight, folks, and I don't want to talk too long because Zoom calls are very boring when one person is doing all the talking. So uh, let me uh, ask you a couple questions here. You might have seen this in your own life or you've seen in the lives of other friends who are not Christians or used to be Christians, but think about this temptation of falling back into salvation by works, salvation by earning it uh, before God. Why is it so tempting to think that? Why is our culture so in love with this idea of uh, salvation by works? Uh, and then the second question is, uh, how can we, you and I, stay true to the gospel according to Jesus? But let's, let's tackle this first question first. Why do you think it's so tempting to fall back into this gospel of works, this salvation by works. So uh, Laura Lee, I'll uh, rely on you to uh, lead this discussion. Yeah. Yeah, kind of what he said, um, what Rick said about 
you know, it, it is really tempting to, to focus on salvation by works. Um, so yeah, so why is, why do you think that it, that we kind of fall back into that, that that's kind of a tempting um, thing to, 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 yeah, to fall back on? This is Aaron. I, I joined late on, on the first part of the conversation, but um, Very good. you know, I think, you know, we are in a merit-based society as well sometimes, and we, we want to feel like we've, we've, we, our, our efforts mean something. So we want to, you know, earn, earn it and, and feel like we've, we've, we've won a reward. But I, and I agree, like, I think you have to do something. Right? We have to keep the commandments. We're here to be tested. We, we have a certain amount of effort and work that we do need to we put in. But at the end of the day, it, it's, you know, it's, it's the grace of God, right? It's, it's atonement as a gift and, and we can't do it alone. We can't do it by ourselves. It's not our own efforts aren't ever going to be enough. We can never be perfect by ourselves. We need, we need the, the savior, we need the atonement. And I think we have to recognize that or else we discredit the entire plan, right? The atonement of Jesus Christ is central to everything. And if we rely upon our own works, it you know, discredits the, and it doesn't give value and respect to the atonement and, and what it means for us and how important that is. So, I, but I do think, you know, merit-based society and we, we want to know that we've, we've earned it. And yeah, mm -hmm. it, it seems that there's a, the story of the vineyard, those who labored in the vineyard. I always think about that, the guy who came first and got mm -hmm. a reward and the guy who came last and, and got the same reward. And he's like, hey, but I've, I toiled longer, right? right. I, I should get a greater reward because I've been here all day long working hard in the vineyard. So, but at the end of the day, it, it's, it's the, the savior's gift to us that, that matters. Right. Yeah. And kind of what we, Deidre, that's her name, right? Yes. Uh, your friend. Yeah. Kind of even what we talked about with her of, of me saying at the beginning of like how I um, have, have, you know, been in the faith my entire life and, you know, she came in later, you know, it, and it wasn't any fault to her, you know, that she had, had gone through these things. And a lot of people grow up in, in homes and, and, and in environments where, you know, obviously Christ isn't preached. So, you know, it's, it almost kind of levels the playing field in a way of, you know, what Rick said before about it being a gift, you know, it's not, you know, I'm not better because I grew up in a Christian home, you know, compared to DJ, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a time thing. It's, it's all relying on, on, on Christ and, and his, like what you were saying, Aaron, about it being the grace of God and about being a gift um, rather than, you know, how long someone's in something or like what they do. Um, so yeah, it's Christianity is pretty cool <laughs> in that way compared to other religions, you know, even mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta do all these things to, to get closer to how many other gods you have, you know, in some other religions. So, um, that's, that's what makes it so different. So yeah. Any other thoughts on, on that? Why is salvation by works So tempting i think because it's easier also to prove that charity um can get me a ticket to heaven because i've known a lot of christians that um they live double lives they um they do all these great things but yet they're horrible wives or husbands or they beat on their children or etc and i'm just like wow if i was here in church because of them i would be lost <laughs> you mm. know yeah 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 exactly you know it's we i was um just talking to some of my high school kids today about love you know doing um the you know first corinthians 13 is that right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah first corinthians 13 <laughs> i didn't want to just like throw out yeah, about the love chapter yeah the love chapter yeah. of like if you uh you know do all these things but you don't love you know, then it pretty much means nothing, you know, and in a way, you know, if it's not connected with, with God and, um, you know, the fact that God is love and God provides grace, um, then, you know, those things that you're doing may be just for show or maybe not actually coming from a place of love. It's just coming from a place of, I look good or I'm doing all these good things and stuff. So yeah, yeah, for sure. There's, we're all hip we're all hypocrites in a certain extent, but there are some real bad hypocrites in some ways of they say they're Christians and they they don't they're not actually so yeah for sure any any other thoughts on that if we could 
if we could earn our salvation, then Christ, there'd be no need for him to die for our sins. We could just do it ourselves. Yeah, someone else wanted to jump in there. No, I was just going to say, I think a lot of um, things culturally are kind of, if you don't have faith in God and you don't have faith in yourself, then the basic, the most important things, you do a lot of things to fill voids. And I think that's a cultural thing as well. So, you know, if you haven't grown in that place or in yourself, you get caught up with a lot of um, the cultural aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're kind of relying, are you saying like you, you kind of rely on other things rather than God? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, one of the ways, yeah, you're relying on other things besides like your own faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 and I think, yeah, it's so easy for us to, to, to rely on things that we see and things that are in our life and even kind of going back to what Aaron said about, about you know, there is an aspect of like us doing things in our faith and there is an aspect of us following the commandments and everything, but you know, it, we, we can't twist it and we can't move it into the fact of, oh, I'm doing these things. And because the things that I'm doing now, I'm like saving myself, you know, it's, it's not that it's coming from, from, from God guiding you from his love from, you know, it's not, we can't earn our own salvation but we can, you know, rely, on, we have to rely on God for that. And, you know, just like what you were saying about, we can't rely on other things or other, you know, even ourselves for that. Um, we have to rely on God for salvation, which is kind of the point that we're talking about with this of, of it's why it's so tempting because there's so much in our life that it's like right there. It's hard not to rely on that really awesome chocolate pie or whatever it is. <laughs> so yeah, any other, yeah, go ahead, Rick. I have another friend. He's a bit older than me. He used to be a pastor and then he fell away from his faith. So I said to him one day, well, if there is a God and if you go before him one day, what are you going to say? And he said, well, I tried to be a good person. And it just amazes me. Mm -hmm. After people leave the church, they always... <laughs> Well, maybe not always, but as far as I can tell, most of the time, they always, yeah, most of the time, they always, most of the time, they get back to this idea of good works, that it's through being a good person that they can earn their salvation, save themselves. And that's just not the message of Jesus. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's just kind of like what they teach us in Sunday school. It's all about, it's all about Jesus. Um, we just kind of need to be reminded of it sometimes <laughs> as adults yeah, yeah. And we're like we can do everything but it's really back to those basics and back to who he is uh, yeah you guys go to a lutheran church and if you look back into your history martin luther he was adamant about this it's by faith god's grace it's by faith that you appropriate god's grace into your life yep yep and now actually not all of us go to lutheran church a lot of us on the call are not Lutheran. Um, there's some that do, that are, that come on, but I don't think anybody here actually is. So, wow. But there's also another good education tip. There you, you go. You can learn from those Lutherans. You can learn from <laughs> us. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts before we go to the, the next question that Rick had for us? Okay. I think we can go on to the next question. Yeah. How can we stay true to the gospel? I think even our own lives, when times are hard or we're disgusted with church or whatever, uh, it's easy for us to lose track of the gospel as well. And uh, what can we do to uh, maintain our faithfulness and steadfastness to the gospel according to Jesus? Um, what I do mostly is, is like things like this and make sure I go to several different Bible studies and try to make sure they're not, um, they don't give conflicting information so that I know that it's accurate mm -hmm. the way I'm following. And, um, and also whenever I doubt something in my own heart or something, I, I look it up on internet or wherever, like on Bible websites to try to figure out if it's really wrong or if it's just something that humans believe or or a uh, worldly belief. I mean, like something that God did not teach. So, um, yeah. 
just always look back to scripture and people who know the scripture better than me, things like that. Yeah, that's a great one. I definitely do that a lot because <laughs> there's most people know more than I do about the Bible. So yeah, it's good to to refer back and it, yeah, it's going to different Bible studies and, and hearing different things would be, you know, pretty interesting and hopefully they're all pretty um, biblically based. But yeah, just, you know, being with other Christians and hearing you know, what, what scripture says, obviously going back and, and doing your own research. And I think that's an important thing that sometimes we forget or something that, that we need to do as adults, you know, cause as children, you kind of just, you know, take in the information like, oh yeah, this is what my teacher said. So I'll just believe it or whatever. Um, but as adults, we critically think, and we, we question a lot of things. And I think it's good that we do that. Um, and we look it up. So, cause there can be a lot of false information out there. So um, yeah, any, anybody else like to, to share how to stay true to the true gospel? I think um, daily devotionals, studying the word every single day, um, apart from fellowship with other believers, we have to test the spirits. We have to make ourselves approved. Yeah. That's, that's crucial because we are living in uncertain times and there's a lot of wind doctrines that are very false. And mm -hmm. if we're not rooted and grounded, we can easily fall astray. Exactly. Yeah, this is a time in history that's just like very, you know, information just thrown at us just from <laughs> all different sides. And it's just you know, at our fingertips, we can just see so many different things and, and hear so many different things and read so many different things. Um, and it's, you know, with social media and everything, everybody's telling us their opinion, even if we don't want to hear it or, you know, and we don't know which one is true and stuff. So yeah. yes, I think it's very, it's very good to, to have our own personal relationship with God and, and to, to be in it daily. Cause we're, we're without us even knowing we're, you know, soaking information every day that, you know, we don't, sometimes we don't even realize. So it's good to, to be rooted in that, in, in what is actually true, um, to kind of defy those things in our life that are not. So yeah. Any, any other thoughts about that? I think, um, kind of a thought that, that I would have about about the, you know the, the gospel messages um for me and i haven't really done this a, a ton i probably should do it more but just um asking for forgiveness and asking kind of repenting in my personal devotion time kind of what um going off of what lily says about personal devotions just realizing that sometimes it i do get ahead of myself and i do kind of rely on my own works and my own maybe not necessarily for salvation, but definitely more than I probably should and kind of get a big head about things. So I think for me, sometimes it just takes a moment of kind of going back to, you know, God got me where I am and he got me through, you know, my life and he'll continue to do that. And, you know, I'm, I'm not alone and, you know, all of those good reminders um, and repenting of, of, you know, when I do rely on myself and I'm not relying on on him. Um, but I think it is true as we talk about the gospel and salvation to always kind of remind ourselves it's not about what we do, um, but what, what Christ has done for us. So um, yeah, that's probably what I would say. Um, any, anybody else would like to share before we, before we move on? Good stuff, guys. Good stuff. All right. Rick, handing it over to you. Tossing the ball. <laughs> well, uh, as we think about the nature of salvation, the gospel according to Jesus, and we get that and, and hang on to it, we're faithful with that, then at some point we think about sharing it with other people. Uh, so... Doug Schaup and Don Everts wrote a book called I Once Was Lost, and it, they talk about five thresholds of conversion. 
I think what they're getting at is that conversion is also often a gradual process. It doesn't happen all at once. You think to Deidre's story, it took her a long time to just come to the realization that she should place her faith in Jesus. Now, in the end, it went pretty fast, but there was a long buildup to it. So Schaup and Everts have identified five stages that people go through. They're called uh, thresholds. The first one is just to come to trust a Christian. In Deidre's case, the backstory was that there were a couple of missionaries at the Hopi Reservation that she had come to trust. And so when she thought about perhaps becoming a Christian, she thought back to Brad and Sarah, the missionaries at Hopi, and she had trusted them. So first step is just to trust a Christian. Second is to become curious. You're curious about the bigger issues in life and perhaps curious about the faith of another person. Uh, thirdly, you become open to change. So this is usually the most difficult threshold to go through. You might be dabbling in the idea of faith. You might be saying, hmm, interesting. Hmm, I'm curious. Yeah, I like these Christians. That doesn't necessarily mean you're open to becoming a Christian. <laughs> but once you do, that's when big change can really take place. So first you trust, then you become curious. Then you're actually open to the possibility of living your life in a different way, living your life according to the gospel. And fourthly, you become a true seeker of Jesus. And fifthly, you cross the line of faith. Schaup and Everett, they're, what they're not saying is that every single person who comes to faith go through these five thresholds. That's certainly not true, but uh, they interviewed hundreds, hundreds of people who did come to faith and they boiled it down to these five categories. And I guess I've seen it over and again many times in my own life too, as I've uh, seen people come to faith. Uh, so let's see here. How do I wanna do this? Uh, I think, yeah, let's, uh, I'll review these quickly. So it's trust and then curious, then openness, seeking and crossing the line. So uh, I'd like to have everyone think about one person that God may, has placed in, may have placed in your life. It's someone from school or from work or in your family or neighborhood. And you just have an intuition, a spiritual intuition, uh, leading by the Holy Spirit, that this is no accident that God has placed this person in your life for a reason and that you're supposed to be a witness to them. And maybe uh, they need to go through these five thresholds. Um, so I'd like you to all think about one person and you don't have to be positive about it, but at least there's some hints, some clues, some indications that God has placed this person in your life. Okay, can you think of one person? And then secondly, what threshold might they be in? I know this is a little bit of a holy speculation here, a little bit of guesswork, and you're new to the five thresholds. So even if it's not perfect, that's okay. Just take a guess at it, take a stab at it. So do you think this person has come to trust you or trust another Christian? Do you think they're generally curious about the big questions in life, maybe curious about faith even, perhaps. Maybe they're even open and they've shown some willingness to maybe come to church or talk about spiritual matters. Or maybe they're really advanced and they are getting close to becoming a Christian. Maybe they're actually seeking Jesus and getting close to that fifth threshold. So uh, think of one person and then think of what threshold they might be in. So uh, Laura, I'm going to turn it back to you. And I think I'll leave these up right here. Okay. Yeah, I put it in the chat just in case you were going to, but that's fine. Yeah, that's good. Okay. You put them in chat? Yeah. Or you want me to put them in chat? Nope. That's fine. I put them in the chat, but we can just leave it up. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So I'll turn it over to you to Laura to just uh, lead the discussion here about uh, thinking of one person that God has placed in your life and then what threshold they might be in. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, you know, kind of a good transition from what we had just talked about with, um, you know, the true gospel and how, you know, we ourselves kind of um, understand and believe, you know, that it's that it's through Christ, it's not by our own works. Um, and then, you know, as, you know, there's there's a reason that we believe, there's a reason that we, that you guys came to this 
this uh, Bible study, you know, this, um, there, there's a reason. And I, you know, um, a lot of what Rick talks about is, you know, just kind of talking to other people about, about your life, about your faith is, is a witness enough. But as we kind of transition into thinking outwardly, kind of these mission conversations that we're talking about, um, yeah, are there people in your life, kind of what Rick was saying, and yeah, what threshold? So um, just kind of open it up for discussion. Hey, I can start since I started this discussion. Sure. <laughs> I have a friend named Hank. I'm a golfer, so I met him at the golf course. And I would say Hank is, he's curious, maybe open to change even. I've just seen God work in his life. I can't orchestrate these changes in Hank's life, but God is. So Hank has had a few uh, challenges this year. He's maybe uh, 10 or 15 years younger than me, probably in his 40s or maybe he hit 50 years old. And uh, he lost his brother this year. He's had some injuries, he can't play golf. And so I've been texting him Bible verses and he's really been responding. Really? Nice. Yeah, he's yeah. been texting me back. Thank you, that makes me feel better. Uh, keep sharing these things. So I'm gonna keep sharing Bible verses with uh, Hank. And I just feel like God put him in my life for a reason. He's a very good player too. <laughs> I'm a decent golfer. He's definitely a step beyond me. So I really respect him as a player and we enjoy being on the golf course together. Yeah, and I think before I kind of open it up again, I think one of the things that that Rick has taught me is, you know, in in a way, you know, I think sometimes we're scared to like talk to people about about God because we're scared of their response, you know, which is kind of natural, but you know, there's sometimes people surprise you and they're more open to talking about it and to, you know, receiving Bible verses and stuff than we think. Um, and a lot of times, sometimes we just gotta have to step out and, and, and be, um, not be afraid to, to do that. Um, yeah, because we just don't, we just don't know. We don't know where people are at. We don't know anything. So about their life. So yeah, that's, that's encouraging that someone could be encouraged by Bible verses, you know, even if they don't say that they're necessarily Christian. So yeah, any, any um, of anybody else kind of have someone in their life that may not necessarily be a Christian um, that, that we know about or that you know about? Um, I can kind of share mine. Um, there's this, <laughs> there's this, <laughs> I'm laughing because this is, it's not a funny story. It's just kind of weird. Um, so my friend, I don't know why I'm laughing. There's, I've um, actually Shway, the one that comes on this chat, she told me about this thing called Bumble BFF. And so you can find friends instead of, you know, you, it's a dating app, but you can also find friends on it. So it's weird because like you swipe left and right for friends. It's weird, <laughs> but it's, it was good because I met someone on there that was a girl that's like on the Bumble BFF app part. And she, uh, and we've been, we've re been really bonding over um, like the Avengers and Disney and just like, you know, things like that, that I, and Star Wars, you know, just things like that, that we both love. And, you know, sometimes we text each other things like, oh yeah, have you seen the new episode of whatever we're watching? Or And um, I think that has been really awesome just having that level of trust. And she's told me before that she's not a Christian, but she, because um, she used to be, I think, and she isn't really anymore. So I think it's definitely the level of trust. We haven't really talked about the faith as much, but um, I think, you know, there could definitely be other conversations about it, you know, why did she leave, you know, what was kind of the reason sort of thing. So, and I think that we've talked about this before in our, our Bible study, but um, when we do talk about going and telling other people, I think some of the, the, the best, um, you know, ways to really witness it are in your relationships that you're in, whether they're Christian or whether they're not, um, being in relationships with people and kind of 
looking at these thresholds of, you know, obviously in any relationship, you have to start with trust, you know, like any good relationship, whether it's unbeliever or not. So, um, yeah. So I think, you know, what Rick teaches is really about the relationship side of, of how to, to talk to other people about God, not just like, oh, you know, Jesus loves you and then never see them again. I mean, sometimes that happens, but um, to really kind of form those relationships where you'll see them again. So I think with her, I think that has, we've kind of found the common ground of we really like movies and things like that. So, um, and then whatever, wherever God, you know, leads in that way, um, he'll, he'll kind of lead me. And, and that's kind of the same with any of your guys' relationships that you have too. Um, that it starts with that trust and then it kind of goes on from there. So yeah, any, any, does anyone, would, would anybody like to share um, any stories like that? Any things that um, anybody that you know? I'd like to agree with you, Laura. Um, I think that trust is a major key because people will surprise you. Um, if you share something in common with someone like movies or books or anything that's not religion or, or, or politics, I think that people will be much more open. And once you have that trust, you've developed that trust. Next thing you know, you talk about religion and yeah, they're much more, they're easier to like see you in a different light. They're, they're, they're not quick to shut you down. That's mm -hmm. happened to me in the past when I used to work in corporate. And yeah, I saw a lot of people. I mean, I was surprised because I'm very shy. I'm very shy. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I actually don't really sense your shyness at all when you've been talking. So really? Oh, you're good. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're good. I'm working on that weakness. <laughs> I'm turning it into strength. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, you know, it's not like I got you. Like when you, when you become, you know, friends with people, it's not, oh, you know, now I'm going to like, you know, it's not like trickery where you're like, oh, now I'm going to like talk to them about G Jesus. You know, it's when you get in a relationship with someone, you, you care about them. It's, it's not that you're like, now I got to bring them over, you know, to like the, the bad side or whatever, you know, it's, you want to share it because you actually genuinely care about them. Not, not that you just, you know, forcing them. Right. Right. You just like mm -hmm. want them in your club and yeah. you be like, yeah. Mm -hmm. now you're on my side you know or whatever so yeah it definitely that relational side that trust definitely is part of it but yeah any other thoughts um on this i i really like lists so this is just these these lists just make me really happy so um yeah anybody else like to share you know my only my thought i couldn't you know, I was thinking about the relationships with people I have that, you know, maybe aren't as, you know, religious or, um, you know, dedicated. I, actually, I don't know if they're like on the spectrum, but sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I'm leaving them with on their mind and maybe that's me. I need to get to know them and ask the question and even see if they even thought about it, these things, right? To see where they're on the list. I just, sometimes I just don't think, you know, religion is just even on their mind at all. And so, but maybe it is. And I just haven't asked the questions to find out whether or not they, they would like to learn more or they have. Mm -hmm. uh, an interest or, or if they're on or if they're somewhere in this in this timeline or threshold in their in their faith and their development and their testimony so uh, right. that was me made me made me think i need to maybe you know at least ask the questions and find out mm -hmm. yeah maybe yeah maybe they're not even thinking about it until aaron comes in and they're like whoa i haven't thought about this in a while but yeah no that's that's fair you know sometimes and you know in some ways I think I think we talked about this with I think we had this conversation with um, with you, Rick, in one of our our talks about sometimes we kind of uh, turn off our our Jesus talk or like the way that we talk about God or Jesus with other Christians. Sometimes we turn that off without even knowing it when we're around people that aren't Christian. Like we can just openly be like, oh yeah, I prayed today, or like, oh yeah, I went to church and I heard this message, you know, with other Christians. But then when when we're not around other Christians, we kind of like just talk about random stuff and not about our faith. So kind of even just, just, you know, just talking with people about your life, you know, oh, I did, I went to this 
this Bible study this other day and we talked about this or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost easier when you talk about yourself and your life rather than just kind of coming in and being like, do you believe in Jesus? You know, <laughs> or whatever. Like you can't say that obviously, but there are also other ways to, to, to get around it as well. Um, to kind of open that up, but it's easier said than done for sure. So don't, good don't conceal it. Yeah. Don't conceal it. Exactly. Don't conceal it. Just like Elsa and her powers. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> Disney reference. Nice reference. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts about the, the five thresholds? I think these are um, these thresholds. I kind of asked Rick to bring these up just because um, you know, as we're talking about evangelism and th evangelism and things, you know, not only is it like, oh, where are they at, but also where could they be? You know, what, you know, the love, it's only kind of like levels, um, a little bit of, you know, they could be to the next, the next number. Um, so yeah. Any other, any other thoughts about kind of what we've been talking about, about evangelism and everything before we move on? Cool, cool. All right. Hand it over back to you, Rick. I feel like a news anchor or something. Back to you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's nice to be uh, partnering with uh, Laura Lee. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, here's some uh, suggested resources. Uh, the book I just mentioned, I Once Was Lost by Everts and Schaub. This is the best book on evangelism out there, as far as I'm concerned. They just do a great job of helping us kind of home in on our friends who are not Christians and sharing the gospel with them in ways that are very appropriate to where they are on this spectrum, on uh, whatever threshold they're in. And the whole premise is that God is the one who's working in their life. So my friend Hank, he's such a good guy. I love Hank. But what is God doing in Hank's life? That's the big question here. And how can I participate? So I once was lost does a good job of leading us into that. And then the uh, book I have here is uh, Faith Unexpected, which is a, a book of stories. So Deidre's story is in there. It's just a short book. And I give these out to my friends who are not Christians. I give them out all the time. <laughs> and uh, you can pick it up cheap at faithunexpectedstories.com. And let's see, I think I'll put that in here. Uh, www.faithunexpectedstories.com if you're interested. I'm not trying to sell books here. I don't care about that actually. What I do care about is that we have a resource to give to our friends, a resource of stories, powerful stories of people coming to faith that you can share with a friend. Um, so, uh, it's in the chat area if you're interested in looking that book over and getting a copy uh, or more for yourself. So, Laura Lee, that's all I have. Maybe I could uh, yeah. offer a prayer and then turn it back over to you. Sure. Do you want to do the, the Q&A thing or do you want to pray now and then we do the Q&A? Uh, sure. Why don't I pray and then uh, sure. then we do, do a little Q&A. But, Laura, I thank you for this group and uh, thank you for each person on this call. Thank you that you've given us the gift of salvation. Help us to steward it well, to remain faithful to the gospel. And then, Lord, to turn and share it with others, not keep it to ourselves. To share it with others in an appropriate way, in a way that makes sense with what you're already doing in the lives of our non-Christian friends. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah, so, Laura Lee, I'll turn it over to you for whatever you want to do next. We can do yeah. Q&A or whatever is in your heart. For sure. Yeah, thank you so much, Rick. We appreciate coming in and we I've, I've I didn't really tell everybody this except Rick I've been recording this whole thing <laughs> so I can share it with other people I should have done that last week or first week but um other people kind of suggested because they couldn't make it so I have recorded everything um that was said and then I'll just share it to them and stuff so um there's that and um yeah so I guess we will kind of ask if anybody has any questions for Rick, any Q&A about anything that we talked about, just personal life things, 
Um, and then at the end, I do want to break out into pairs. Um, Rick and I will be together and then everybody else will be paired up with other people um, in, in the group. And then we'll do prayer requests and just kind of pray for one another um, in that. But before we do that, does anybody have any Q&A questions that they would like to ask Rick personal life about you know the gospel we talked about or the thresholds, any other things about um, evangelism, um, stump the chump. That's yeah, stump the chump. Question. I'm um, the chump. Yes. Anybody like to um, stump the chump? So yeah. I guess I'll start with the first one, then we'll see if anybody has another one. Um, If you could just say, I'm trying to think how I want to say this. Um, just kind of summarize. If they were kind of like, you know what, Rick, I heard you know about evangelism. I hear you kind of can teach about it. What is like, I only really have like a minute. I'm, I'm going to class. I don't know. <laughs> I have something to do. Um, can you just summarize, you know, what is like the most important thing when we think about evangelizing or think about talking to other about to others about Jesus? You know, what is what would you say is kind of the most important things to um, to remember when we do that? I should make Laura say this because uh, I've been in a <laughs> I've been training her for two years, but uh, <laughs> well, if we really believe that God goes before us that God got there first, that God's already working in the lives of our friends who are not Christians, then all we have to do is discern. Evangelism is, first of all, discernment. What is the Lord doing? So, Aaron, you said, I probably need to ask questions of my non-Christian friends, and that's one of the best ways to exercise discernment, is to ask them what they're interested in, ask them about their spiritual lives, ask them if they have any spiritual journey or church background or any interest in religion or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And so when, if we can uh, figure out that other people in our lives have spiritual interest, and I'm guaranteeing you they do, not everyone, but some will, then we can say to ourselves, oh, well, the Lord got there first. He's the one, he's the evangelist. He's the one who's working in their life. And he's inviting me in to participate in what he's already doing. So a good metaphor here is uh, he, he's calling me to get out of the boat and walk on the water, take a risk, mm -hmm. participate in what he's doing. And that's what I did with Hank and a few other of my friends at the golf course. Just ask questions and joke around and mention church and mention Bible and mention prayer and, and just see what happens, see what they say, see if they respond positively. Um, so that would be the first thing that we need to do, in my view, is uh, discern what God is already doing so that we don't bring people to Jesus. I mean, excuse me, we don't bring Jesus to people. Uh, Jesus is already there working in their life. And our job is to figure out what that is and get out of the boat, walk on water by faith, take a risk to participate in his work in witness. Yeah. Now, Laura, you could have said that because you've, yeah. you've heard me give that speech about a dozen <laughs> yeah. times. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and it's, it is cool too. Also, you, you know, you said before too, like, it doesn't have to be this perfect thing that you, you know, no. oh my gosh, like this is Billy Graham. Like it's, it doesn't have to be, you know, perfectly crafted either. Like sometimes when it's awkward and when it's not perfect, it's more relatable or it's like, yeah, you know, they, it cares more, you know, it's, it's kind of like that thing with with girls, like when when um, when guys ask them out, it's not the guy that's like, "Hey, girl, what's up?" It's like the guy that's awkward <laughs> and like, "Hey, I, you know, it'd be really cool if like we go out." You know, that's more almost more endearing in a way. I don't know, uh, maybe maybe not every girl thinks that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, if like if you're just yourself and you you know you care yeah. about this a lot. Um, you know, whether they reject you or whether they are like, oh, I'm interested, you know, your God is, is already there, kind of like what you're saying, and he'll give you the words to, to say. So, yeah. 
just uh, taking that step. So yeah, any other questions? Sorry, we went on a little thing there. But any any question, any other questions that we that anybody would like to ask um, Rick before we end in prayer? Cool, cool. Oh, Aaron just left. All right. So yeah, thanks for coming, guys. We'll uh, we'll kind of end us end us all in prayer. I'll kind of put you guys in these. Hold on a sec. Do, do, do. Um, in these these breakout rooms uh, to pray, just pray for another, um, ask prayer requests, and then Rick, I will meet with you in after this, after we do this. So um, I'm just gonna pray. So much prayer, so much prayer happening in this in this group. Um, I'll just kind of do uh, pray us out, and then you guys um, can do prayer requests um, and pray for another. Um, thank you so much, dear God. Uh, thank you so much for bringing us all here uh, to learn more about you, uh, learn more about your true gospel, um, and to know, um, you know, get, get some get some insight um, from Rick of, of um, you know, how to talk to other people and, and to evangelize to others. Um, I, I pray that you would um, be with Rick as he as he goes on and um, continues to educate others as he continues to. Um, you know, follow you and to evangelize to others as well. Um, and um, I just, I pray that um, you continue to guide all of us in our own lives to do the same. Um, we love you so much. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. Thanks for coming and we'll break out into groups.